today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. Many of our people failed to make it, but we appreciate you that did come for the service. I know many of the churches are not having services at all today. And we thought we'd have the service this morning. There'd be no service tonight here at Northside. But we do have the advantage of the radio listening audience. Now, what I mean by that, we have the privilege of broadcasting our Sunday morning service from 11 to 12. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, if you're not having services in your church today and you're sitting there listening to my voice, if you get on the phone and call a friend and have them to tune in and get to Northside Baptist Church Hour, we'll try to be a blessing to them. You'll be doing them a favor and be doing us a favor as well. So why don't you do that? You there in the radio listening audience, you have friends that maybe would like to be in church and maybe they're not having services in their church today. And just call them and tell them to tune in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour, to the station where you're now listening. And we'll try to be a blessing to them with the singing as well as a message from God's Word. So we appreciate you in the auditorium. We appreciate you that's listening in the radio listen audience. And we'll now turn the service to Paul. He'll direct the song service. Now I'm sure what he has in store for us will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul at this time. Get your hymn on, turn to page 199. Keep in mind the Wednesday night service, weather permitting, I hope you'll be here Wednesday night and bring your Bibles and get in on the Bible study and prayer meeting here at Northside this coming Wednesday night. Now we appreciate our visitors that's dropped in to be with us yet today and most certainly appreciate you in the radio listening audience and may the Lord bless you. I have a few things I want to say at this time. Uh, this will be the last time I make mention of our trip to the Holy Land in March and that's only about eight weeks away now but if you're interested in this tour you still have time to get in on it if you providing you see me in the next few days or call me it's a wonderful tour we'll be going to Israel and then of course you have your choice of going to Rome Italy or Cairo Egypt and we're we'll visiting some wonderful places that I'm sure you're interested in I have brochures available and it's only a nine-day trip. We'll be leaving on Monday and coming back on the next Tuesday. 
And some of you out in the radio listening audience maybe have never taken a trip of this type. You've reached retirement age. And this would be a real trip of a lifetime. There may be some of you listening now because of being in your own church on Sunday. You haven't heard me make mention of the tour. And you still have time to get in on it. Some of the, you preachers that's probably listening today, this would be a wonderful trip for you or some of you deacons and members of your church if you send your pastor and his wife. But remember, in order to get in on this tour, you must contact me in the next within the next week and we can probably get you on the tour and I hope somebody in the radio listen audience would be concerned and we'll get in touch with us right away we'll be glad to supply you with a brochure talk with you on the phone or come to your home or you can come and pay me a visit but it's only about eight weeks away now and so we must do what we're going to do and do it quickly and I'll tell you to walk on the ground where Jesus walked Ride the Sea of Galilee where he calmed the waves. To go to Mount Calvary where he was crucified. And to see the garden tomb. Go to the upper room where the Holy Spirit came. And many of those places then go to Rome or Egypt. They in Rome and, and see uh, the Vatican and the Sistine Chapel. And many historical places in Rome. If you go to Cairo you see the pyramids. And wonderful scenes there. And so if you're interested now is the time to do something about it. The price is reasonable, and we'd be glad to work with you in this respect. And this will be the last time I make mention of the tour for this year. Now today, the Lord willing, I'm going to bring a message on the Holy Spirit. Now the reason I'm going to bring the message on the Holy Spirit, I, I've spoken on the Holy Spirit here in this church a number of times, but I feel like we have a vast radio listen audience that can be helped by this message on the Holy Spirit. And so if you'll call a friend and have them to be tuned in, then we appreciate it. I do have a book on the Holy Spirit, 52 seven-point outlines on the Holy Spirit. It took me some time to compile these outlines. There are 52 meaty outlines, have the scripture and so forth. And included in this book, you have uh, here some of the titles seven misconceptions in regard to the Holy Spirit. Then you have seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, seven sins against the Holy Spirit, seven works of the Holy Spirit, seven ways the Holy Spirit is given, and seven things the Holy Spirit does in the child of God, and seven times the Holy Spirit speaks. Now you'll find these in this book titled 52 seven point outlines on the Holy Spirit. It's been some time since I've mentioned this book on the air or even to the people here in the church and if you're interested in obtaining a copy of this book then you write in and enclose a gift of three dollars or more we'll send the book to you post paid and I'll give you my mailing address in a moment but it's a wonderful little book. I spent many, many weeks and even months in compiling these outlines. 52 seven-point outlines and they're meaty. You have scripture and other comments pertaining to the outline. And they're very helpful to any minister, Sunday school teacher, Bible student. And they're sound. They've been a blessing to a lot of people. I've heard many comments on this book. And it's available. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603. That's Post Office Box 501, zip code 30603, Athens, Georgia. So you pray for us and write to us. I'm in need of hearing from the radio listening audience. We're on this great station seven days a week. We're heard each day at 12 noon. We're heard on Sunday from 11 to 12. And of course, we have to take care of the bills and pay the expense. And my mail's been greatly off recently because I'm sure of the bad weather. But you that love God, a word of the wise is sufficient. You pray for me and write to me and stand by this home mission work. And we appreciate it greatly. We're trying to get the gospel out in every way possible. And so we appreciate the privilege and the great open door of radio that reaches out many, many miles and carries the gospel into the mountains and the flatlands and while well, it goes in many directions a long way and so 
We appreciate the privilege. So you let me hear from you, and I appreciate it very much. Everybody stand to your feet, will you please? I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're glad to have one of our young missionaries, his dear wife, passing through today and stopped in to be with us. I'm going to ask him to come and lead us in a word of prayer for the offering. He has a very odd name. His name is John Smith. And so we're going to ask him to come around and lead our hearts to God in prayer and thanksgiving for the offering. Brother Smith, we're glad to have you and your good wife today, and you lead us in prayer. Thank you, Pastor. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank thee for the opportunity to come to thee. And Lord, we realize that all that we have or ever hope to be, we find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this good church and pastor. I pray for your blessing the service today and all that said and done might be for your honor and glory. We pray for you bless the offering and it might be for the hastening and for the advancement of thy kingdom. Yes. And we pray to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Smith, and may God bless you. We appreciate you and your good wife being here with us today. And so may God bless you as you give, and uh, may the Lord's richest blessings be upon even you in the radio listening audience. And if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to John chapter 16, will you please? You know, a dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. I love a beautiful little dove. I think they're very beautiful. I feel like I did a good deed the other day. A little dove came flying in to my back door. I have a glass sliding door. Bumped up against the door, and we went out and picked it up. And it's about froze. It uh, didn't look like it was going to make it. And we took the little dove, and warmed it up, and put it up overnight. And next morning, I went out and peeped in while we had it. It looked like it was dead. And then I came to the church and went back. and. Little fellow was sitting on the end of the little box while we had him, and I walked up, and he flew over to the corner of the building, and then he sailed away. Made me feel mighty good to know I helped that little dove, because a dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, John chapter 16, beginning with verse 7, John chapter 16 and verse 7, page 1138 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now if you read on down through verse 15. You can see how a great number of times. The personal pronoun is used. Pertaining to the Holy Spirit. Now we do know the Holy Spirit is a person. Just as much so as Jesus Christ is a person. We realize that. I remember reading a story some time ago that happened out in a little country church. And this preacher was going to preach on the Holy Spirit. And he told his janitor, he said, now we're going to illustrate this message. And I want you to take a dove and climb up in the attic. And when I get to the place where I'll say, let the Spirit descend, like a beautiful dove, I want you to turn that dove loose. Let it fly down over the audience. And that will help to illustrate my message. And so the janitor did exactly that. And the preacher was preaching away. And he came to the place where he said, let the spirit descend like a beautiful dove. Nothing happened. He said again a little louder. He said, I say, let the spirit descend like a beautiful dove. Still nothing happened. And the preacher spoke out a little louder. He said, I say... Let the spirit descend like a beautiful dove. The janitor yelled out from up in the attic. He said, Reverend, he said to the cat up here done ed up that dove. Said, do you think I ought to throw the cat down? So I'm afraid today that we have a lot of cats we're throwing down instead of the doves. What we need is the spirit of God in our services. We have the most highly educated ministry today that the world has ever known. And less power with God. We have our trained preachers, our trained singers, our beautiful churches, beautiful educational systems. 
But we don't have a lot of power with God in this day and time. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the cry and need of the hour. Now there's a lot of people confused about what the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of things contributed to him he's not guilty of. Especially in this day when you have the ecumenical movement, the charismatic movement on the move today. They contribute to the Spirit of God many things that he is not guilty of. We need to find out what the Bible has to say about him and then preach what thus saith the Lord God. And we need a mighty empowerment of God's Spirit today because he can do many things for us and we need him. We can't get along without him. A service without the Holy Spirit of God is like a dog trotting through dry leaves. We need to feel God's presence, to have his power manifested in our services that we might see God's people blessed and sinners come to know God. Now who is the Holy Spirit anyway? According to the Bible, he's a person. In verse 13 of my text, And how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, so he is God the Spirit. He's a person as much so as Jesus Christ is a person. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Bible says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. Notice the capital S on the word Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the Lord. He's a person. He is often called the third person of the Trinity. But he's co-equal with the Father and the Son. And this is really his age. The Lord Jesus Christ said he would go back to heaven. And he told the disciples and apostles to go to Jerusalem. And tarry there until the Holy Spirit came. And they did that. They went there and tarried. They waited for the Spirit to come. Because he was scheduled to come on a set date. And on that set date, on the day of Pentecost, he did come. Now Jesus said, I'm going away, but I will send him to you. And that he did. Now when Jesus Christ was here on the earth, he could only be in one place at a time, uh, bodily, uh, personally. But when the Spirit of God came, the Spirit of God could be everywhere at all times. The Holy Spirit of God is here today in the Northside Baptist Church. He's indwelling his people He's out there in other churches where the gospel is believed and preached, where they have believers. And the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at all times. And he came on the day of Pentecost for that purpose. Now we find according to the Bible that you cannot get sinners saved without the Holy Spirit doing something about it. Now one reason today we're not getting more sinners saved is because the Spirit of God is not convicting. He's not honored. And he's not in many services. Therefore, there's not much very deep conviction. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in great power, Simon Peter stood up and preached a sermon, and 3,000 people repented and received Christ as their Savior. They had the power of the Holy Spirit manifested there in that service. And one sermon produced 3,000 converts. Because the Spirit of God was there in unusual power. Today you can preach about 3,000 sermons and hopefully get one man to God. That's the difference. Now what's the trouble? We still have the same gospel. The trouble is not with God. The trouble is with God's people. We don't have the power of the Spirit of God like we should have in our services. Now he is the one that arrests that sinner. Now we notice the Holy Spirit is a person. Secondly, he does, he arrested the sinner. Notice what he does to the sinner. He arrests him. In John chapter 16 and verse 8, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. He convicts that lost man. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Why and how were they pricked in their hearts? They were pricked in their hearts by the word of God through the operation of the spirit of God. And they were so shaken up until they really wanted to be saved. They said men and brethren what shall we do? And so when that sinner is arrested. Or when he's convicted or pricked by the spirit of God. Then he wants to be saved. He has a desire to be saved. 
You'll never get a man to God until he's first convicted of his sins by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost is the same person. And he's a great high sheriff of heaven. He arrests that sinner and lets him know he's broken the law of God. He's guilty and he's going to hell if he doesn't get saved. Now when that sinner realizes he's lost, he's convicted of his sins, he's on the road to hell and may land there at any moment, then there could be a desire in his heart to be saved, but not until then. And when he has a desire to be saved and repents, it's the Holy Spirit then that gives birth to his soul. A man is not saved by trying to do better, turning over a new leaf, joining the church and being baptized. He is saved by repenting of his sins and the Holy Spirit giving birth to his soul. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 6, that which is born in the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so it's the Spirit of God that births us into the family of God. And the moment we are birthed into God's family, which is a spiritual birth, right then we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. God seals His holy possession. He seals us by His Spirit into the body of Christ. Now after that, what happens? What does the Spirit of God do? Number three, let's notice what He does then for the saints of God. He mothers that babe in Christ. When a little baby is born into the world, the mother with the mother's heart will take that little child and she'll love it and feed it and bathe it and keep it warm and comfortable. And she'll do all she can to make it comfortable because she loves that little babe. It's hers. It's a little darling and she wants to do what she can for it. And so does the Spirit of God for a person when he gets saved. The very moment a sinner gets saved, becomes a babe in Christ, He's placed in the body of Christ by God's Spirit. He's born into God's family by God's Spirit and God's Word. And then he's a babe in Christ. And the Spirit of God begins to mother that convert. That's why you need to keep people when they're saved as babes in Christ in the house of God, in the fellowship with God's people, that they might hear the Word of God, that they might pray and be taught the things of God, and the Spirit of God begins to mother them, loves them, and begins to teach them. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not any man teach you, but as the same anointing teach you all things. The greatest teacher you'll ever have is the indwelling Spirit of God, and he lives in your heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, Without the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. And so if you're saved, you have the indwelling Spirit of God, and He is your teacher, and He will guide you day by day if you'll let Him. In John chapter 16 and verse 13, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Do you want to know the truth? Do you want to know the right, right way? The Spirit of God can lead you and guide you, and He will. Not only that, but He comforts you. The Bible says in John chapter 16 and verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, expect of you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Nobody can comfort you like the Holy Spirit of God. I've had the experience of trying to comfort bereaved people. And maybe, see me, I would try to comfort them in vain. But the very moment they looked to God and the Holy Spirit took over, He could comfort their broken hearts. He is our comforter. And not only is He our comforter, but He teaches that Christian how to pray. We don't know how to pray as we should. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Spirit of God teaches us and helps us to pray. Every born-again believer can pray. You can talk to God. And the Spirit of God will take your groans right into the presence of God and teach you how to pray. Not only does He teach that Christian how to pray, but He gives victory. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, 
Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So it's the spirit of God that lives in you and he's greater than the spirit of the evil one or the devil that's in the world. And then he gives you power to get the job done. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible said you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come up on you and you shall be witness and so forth. And we need that power to get the job done for God. Every one of us needs that soul winning or witnessing power. And then the Holy Spirit will give you holy boldness. When God first saved me, I was kind of timid around God's people. And I didn't mind speaking out in the world with my crowd before God saved me. But when God saved me, I was a little bit timid. But as I began to look to God and serve Him, the Spirit of God gave me boldness to witness for Him. When I first started out as a minister, when I began to preach my first sermons, I would come to the pulpit with trembling knees and a trembling voice because I was a little shaken up. But as I began to look to God, God gave me boldness to stand and preach the gospel or the witness for Him, and He'll do that for any Christian. Not only does He give holy boldness like He did Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost, but He leads us to look for the Lord Jesus. There's something deep down on the inside of you that tells you the Lord is soon coming back again. What is that? It is the Spirit of God. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. The Spirit of God in you is calling for Jesus to come back and take us out of this world. You're longing to go in the rapture. Nobody wants to go by the way of the grave. We want to go by the way of the rapture. And our hearts cry out to God. The Spirit of God in us says, Even so come, Lord Jesus. And according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, when the rapture takes place, it is the Spirit of God that's going to take you out to meet Jesus in the air. See, this is His age, and it's with Him we have to do. Now God expects us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, that's thought number 4 if you want to jot it down. The Bible says, Be not drunk on wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you may say, Preacher Edwards, how may I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Now you're not filled with the Holy Spirit like you'd fill a jar or some container by emptying up maybe what's in it and refilling it. That's not the way you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The way you're filled with the Holy Spirit is that you're completely controlled by the Spirit of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, Verses 1 and 2, present your body a living sacrifice. When you place all on the altar and taken hands off and say, Lord God, regardless of what happens, regardless of what people think of me, regardless of what it's going to cost me, I'm all out for you 100%. I mean business. I want to be used of you, Lord. I want to dedicate my life to be used of thee. I want to know your divine will for my life. I want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. When you come to that place where you're willing to be controlled by the Spirit of God, not your will, not your way, but His way, then you're controlled by the Spirit of God, and that is known as the filling of God's Spirit. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Bible plainly tells you there how you may know the perfect will of God for your life. Now there's some of you wandering around. You don't know what God wants you to do. You don't know the will of God for your life. You can find out the absolute perfect will of God in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. You ought to read that. Underscore that in your Bible. If you're confused about God's will for you, read Romans 1 and 2. Do what God tells you to do there. And the Bible said you can know then the perfect will of God for your life. The Holy Spirit of God will lead you into the perfect will of God. God wants us to be controlled by the Spirit. You may say, preacher, why then should we be filled with God's Spirit? The Bible says, I'll pour water upon him that's thirsting foot upon the dry grounds. 
Jesus said in John 7, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. The moment you're hungry and thirsty to be controlled by the Spirit of God, God will not disappoint you. You may say, Preacher, what would it do for me? When I'm filled with God's Spirit, what would that do for me? Well, it'll give you real spiritual joy. It'll give you peace and satisfaction. It'll make you a better soul winner. It'll create in your heart a desire to do the will of God at all costs. The Spirit of God will do these things for you whenever you feel with the Spirit of God. You may say, now, preach Edwards, I got saved and I'm seeking the baptism. Well, you're on unscriptural grounds. There's no such thing as seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost today. The only baptism of the Holy Spirit is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 for the believers today. And that's when you're baptized into the body of Christ. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is no other. Let nobody kid you. Now there's many feelings of God's Spirit. That is when God takes you over and controls you. Then you're filled with God's Spirit. You may say, preach Evans, what will I do when I'm completely controlled by the will of God? Will I cut some of sauce? Will I stand on my head? Will I get up and jab around in some kind of ecstatic speech that nobody knows what I'm talking about? No, sir. If you're doing that, that proves you know nothing about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God doesn't lead in that manner. Now, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, and you'll also find in uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11, and Acts chapter 19, that people did speak in another language to prove to the Jews that they had received the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ because the Bible said they required a sign. In 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible said that language speaking there was for a sign and a sign to the Jews only. Now when the Jews left the land in 70 AD, the tongue ceased. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible said tongues would cease and they did cease. You don't have any more biblical tongues today. They ceased after 70 AD when the Jews left the land. They were assigned to the Jews, a sign language to the Jews, and the Jews only, and they ceased. You do not have any biblical tongues today like they had on the day of Pentecost, or like they had in Acts chapter 10 that Simon Peter told about in chapter 11, not like they had in Acts chapter 19. All of that's been fulfilled. God brought in the component parts of the church, brought them all together. And when the Jews left the land, that sign ceased. No more tongue speaking today. You may say, preacher, what are these people trying to do? Many of them out here are jabbing around. Some of them don't believe the Bible. Some all tied up in false religions. Some seeking this, some seeking that. And what are they doing? That's not biblical tongues. They may work themselves up into frenzy. They may imitate somebody else. They get into what is called ecstatic speech. But that is not biblical tongues. They're in the same place the church were at Corinth when Paul had to correct them on the tongues question and told them it's better to speak five words in a language where people can understand than 10,000 words in a tongue they couldn't understand. And so we have no need for the tongues today. They were assigned to the Jews. If the need ever arose, I'm sure that God could grant it if he pleased, but it hasn't risen since the Jews left the land and probably never will. There's many great gifts God wants you to, to uh, pray about and surrender, yield, yield to God to that God may give them to you, such as love and mercy and kindness and giving and soul winning and praying. Great number of gifts in the Bible God wants his children to have. And so when you feel with God's Spirit, it began to create these gifts in you. The gift of love, the gift of mercy, the gift of helps, the gift of prayer, the gift of giving, the gift of soul winning. Many, many great gifts for the church today that you can have whenever you're controlled by the Spirit of God. Now there's some great men that were yielded to God for the controlling of God's Spirit that were mightily used of God. And there's multitudes, I'll mention three, Dwight L. Moody, Tari, Finney. These men were completely yielded to God and God controlled them. And Dwight L. Moody never finished the fifth grade in grade school. Yet he was so empowered by the Holy Ghost, he was so yielded to God 
so controlled by the Spirit of God until he robbed hell of over a million souls. He took England and America, as it were, and shook them together and robbed hell of over a million souls, a man that never finished the fifth grade in school. What was his secret? Empowered by the Holy Ghost, completely yielded to God. Charles E. Finney was so yielded to God and so empowered by God's Spirit, whenever people walked into his office, they fell under conviction, and he'd lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Great man of power, walking through a, a mill one day while they were working in the factory, and people fell under conviction. And the superintendent said, we got to do something about this. Charles G. Finney's walked through this building. People are falling under conviction. Let's shut down the machines and have a service. And they did, and a great multitude came to God. What is the secret? Yielded to God, controlled by the Spirit of God. Great missionaries has gone to the field. I could mention numbers of great outstanding missionaries, Pray and Hyde, Livingston, and others that went filled with the Holy Ghost and God used them mightily to bring about revivals and reach the heathen. Now I'm going to mention finally how the saint of God may sin against the Spirit of God. Number one, you can sin against the Spirit of God by grieving Him. Now you may say, Preacher Edwards, how can I grieve the Spirit of God? Jot down the scripture and read it at your convenience. You can grieve the Spirit of God by what God tells you in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30, that tells you exactly how you can grieve the Spirit of God. Then you can quench the Spirit of God according to 1 Thessalonians 5 19. You can ignore Him. You can defile His temple and you can lie to Him. And now it's the fire lied to the Spirit of God. Then finally, you may say, Preach Edwards, you may ask the question, how can the sinner then sin against him? By resisting him, Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, and by hardening his heart and hardening his neck, according to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 15. You may say, Preacher, how about the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? You don't have to worry about that. Nobody's blaspheming against the Holy Ghost today. The Jews did in those days when they said Jesus is doing his work by the working of the devil and if they contribute the work of the devil to the work of the Holy Spirit, then they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You need not worry about blaspheming the Holy Ghost today. You need to worry about resisting or stiffening your neck against him and going on and dying without God. If you are not saved today, you need to repent and turn to God and let the Spirit of God give birth to your soul. Now this message I've delivered today is on cassette tape. If anyone's interested, they might be able to obtain this message that I brought today on cassette tape. Thank you. You've listened well. Stand to your feet, will you please? And let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege. I pray today, dear God, you'll use this message. Speak to many hearts. Help us to honor the Spirit of God, our Father. And may Jesus be glorified by this message today. And thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit of God that we feel even as we bring the message in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. They're going to play on the instruments of maybe a stanza song. And while they play, and if there's anyone that wants to be saved, come back to God or join this church. For any reason you want to come forward, do so while they play on the instruments for just a moment. speaking you may come be seated just a moment please I want to have a minute or two of your time you're not going anywhere in particular anyway you're not going fishing today are you hope not hunting anything like that probably going home while you can get in out of the weather. I want just a minute of your time here. Now Wednesday night we'll have our quarterly business meeting night if weather permits.